Okay. We are recording. Uh, welcome to dealing with Python coding. Um, we are uh, here each month. Uh, here means in DC and in Austin, but actually people all from all the world are joining us today uh, from multiple countries. Um, and we are here to see a demo of a Python library. Each time we pick a different one. Uh, this time it's a connection library to a very known database, uh, it's called Redis, and I'm not an expert there, so I'll let the expert speak. Savannah and Simon are gonna take it away and talk about Redis, and specifically the OM library for Redis, for Python. Sure, I guess first we'll just introduce ourselves. So first up, I'm Simon, I'm the uh, principal developer advocate at Redis, which is a company that is uh, located both in Israel, Austin and Mountain View, California. Um, I'm actually in Nottingham, England, so it's middle of the night for me right now. Um, but both Savannah and I were in Austin last week, we got to visit our office there for the first time. Um, for those in DC, I lived and worked in the DC area for a number of years. I worked in McLean and uh, Reston. So, Savannah. Yeah, I'm Savannah. I'm a developer advocate here at Redis, um, a new-ish developer advocate up until probably about five months ago. I was just a, so not just, but I was a software developer. Um, so excited to sort of transfer this skill set into how I wanted information presented to me as a developer. And excited to share this Redis uh, OM library with you guys today for Python. Okay, so what I'm going to do is go ahead and share a desktop. So let's get this up and running. So hopefully everyone can see that. And what I'm going to do is um, start with some slides, but we're not going to stick with slides. The aim is that this is going to be somewhat interactive. Um, and yeah, there'll be some code and all of that stuff to take a look at. So what we're gonna do is uh, start here. So yeah, we're Simon and Savannah, we're from Redis. Um, if you're interested in talking to us about Redis after this, the best place to go is we run a Discord chat server um, where you can ask us all sorts of things about Redis. There's thousands of people in there and it's at discord.gg slash Redis. Um, I'll post that in the chat later. So what is Redis? Um, you may have heard of it. You may be using it, whether you know it or not. You've almost certainly interacted with something in your daily lives on the internet that is using it. Um, it's an immensely popular open source project and it's often used as cash. Um, what we're here to talk about is using it for many other things that it can be used as because it's actually a general purpose database. Um, the reason why people use it as a cache but also love it for other things is because it keeps a copy of all the data in memory. So this means that if you do anything that involves reading data from Redis, that data comes from memory. So it's gonna be very, very fast. Uh, this then usually leads to the question, well, what happens if we pull the plug and or reboot the server or something happens? Uh, a lot of people don't actually know that Redis is also persistent. So you can configure how you want it to persist that data back to another store, so a disk-based store. But it's never going to do a read from there, which is why it's really, really fast. Uh, it's a network appliance. It's accessed across the network. It lives on a port. So kind of like other databases, you connect to a host and a port and you can use a password if you configure it like that. Um, you can supply it with the username if you've got multiple users set up. And then what's going on with this picture in the background? Um, Redis is a type of data store known as a key value store. So instead of having tables and SQL queries, we have keys and those keys contain values. So what the picture is here is it's actually a woman in the Library of Congress in DC in the 1970s. And she's using this card index system to look up some data. So if you think of Redis as this whole card index system here and like each one of those white labels on the front of a drawer is a key, then that is the bit of information that we need to retrieve data from Redis. Um, Generally with a key value store, if you don't have a key or you don't know one or you can't infer one or make give 
figure out where you stored something, you're not going to be able to retrieve the information. So the key is like critical. It's like a primary piece of information. Um, having said that, we're also going to show you something today where you can use Redis in a more SQL-like way, which makes it more approachable to developers that know that sort of database and also allow you to ask it questions that you wouldn't normally expect to be able to do with a key value store. So the core proposition of Redis is essentially that you can set keys to have values. Um, at the simplest level, values are just strings. So in Redis, strings are binary safe. You can put anything in there you want. You could put a whole JPEG or PNG image in there. If you've got enough memory, you could store MPEG videos in there. Um, and the way that you do that is instead of having a SQL-like language, because Redis is no SQL, it doesn't have that, it has a bunch of commands for doing different things. So there's a set command, so you set a key name to a value. So we set the value of cat to mocker, and that essentially stores the string mocker in some box called cat in Redis. And we can set the value of dog to latte, and then we can say to it, yeah, get, get whatever's in cat, and back comes mocker. So a uh, uh, value that we stored there. So other products do this. So you might have heard of something called Memcache. This does something similar. It's key value store that stores strings. One of the things with Redis is both, you might already be familiar with key value stores and it does more than that. So where might you have used a key value store already? Well, if you're using Python, every time you use a dictionary, that's key value store. So if you think of users up there as a sort of instance of a key value store and we can put things in it, so I can put users the count and set the value to Vlad or users math whiz and set the value to Ada. And then I can ask it what's stored at the key, the count in the key value store users and it'll tell me what's in that. Um, similarly, if you're familiar with JavaScript, uh, either in the front end or in Node, JavaScript objects look exactly like this. So the difference with Redis uh, versus some other products in this field is that other than the speed, keys have different data types. So we can store different things in there and those have different behaviors associated with them. Uh, there's literally a pretty random grab bag of data types in here. And this is partly because Redis was one person's like personal project for a while. There was a guy called Salvatore in uh, Italy. He came up with Redis to solve some problems that he was having in his job, some of them were caching related, but then he also started using it for things like queuing. So there's a list data type and there's a stream data type for that. Um, and then for things like deduplicating data or checking if you've seen something before. So there's a set data type that maps onto a mathematical set. You, know, you can put values into it and they'll get deduplicated and you can ask it, are the values in the set? And it'll say yes or no. Um, People generally find things that are very, very fast also useful for doing things like geospatial searches. So you can put data in there about where, say, the positions of all your you know, app-driven um, rideshare cars are. And you can ask it questions like, which cars are within three miles of this position? Come back with that information extremely quickly. Uh, there's some other ones in there that are kind of lower level, like bitmaps. So if you're interested in storing you know, a big array of zeros and ones and updating individual positions in them, then uh, you might want to use Redis for that. We also have something called a sorted set that allows you to store values uh, against a score or a number. So I could put, you know, string values in a sorted set so the names of all the people on this call and then like numbers for say the order in which we join the call and it will maintain a sorted data structure of that this is often used for like leaderboards in games so what i was going to do was um then talk about some additions to redis that we're going to look at today so on top of core redis um Redis, the company that we work for, sponsors that now and looks after the, the open source project for that. And we've added some additional stuff to it. And we also offer those things in the cloud and available for download. So what we've added that we're going to look at today is a nice graphical user interface for looking at data in Redis and integrating or inspecting it. That's called Redis Insight. That's over there on the left. And then over there on the right, 
Redis has an API for extending it. So you can add what are called modules or extra capabilities that you can write yourself in C or Rust. And we've written some that we've made available. And the ones we're going to look at today are the two green ones. They are search and JSON. So the ability to store JSON documents in Redis and uh, efficiently query just a percentage or a path into that document. Um, and search, which is adding SQL-like lookup capabilities to a key value data store, which normally isn't possible. There's some other things in there that are kind of like their own whole thing. Redis can also be used as a time series database, or you can use it as a graph database if you're familiar with Neo4j and Cypher um, for modeling relationships. Or you can use it as a probabilistic data structure store, um, which is basically an efficient way of storing large amounts of data and approximating things about it without storing all of the data. So what I'm going to do is um, very quickly just swap over to a tool here called uh, Redis Insight. So this is the graphical tool that we have. I've got this connected to a Redis instance, uh, happens to be running on my machine, but it could run anywhere. It could run in the cloud. Uh, we provide a free version of that that has 30 mega memory. It could run in Docker, which uh, we'll look at later in the demo, or um, it can run locally. You can install it. So I've got that here. There's nothing going on here. And database is empty. I'm just going to turn this on so we can see things as I create them. And the way we talk to Redis is, is through commands generally. So I could do things like um, set Simon test. And oops, it's timed out. There we go. That's better. We're reconnected. Right. So I've now got a string value called Simon. And when I click on it, it's set to test. Nothing particularly fantastic here. This is just sort of basic stuff. I can store something and then I would expect to be able to get Simon and you know test. And these things are mutable, so I could set Simon to something. And what you'll see is I've done that. And then when I click, oh, I need to turn the refresh on here as well, make it a bit faster. You will see that the value that's stored in Redis is now something. So again, nothing amazing with strings here, but this is kind of the core use case that people use Redis for a lot. And the reason they do this is Imagine the value that we'd stored here was, say, a JSON document that was an API call response that took a lot of compute or resources to generate. Um, we can store that in Redis, and we can use that as a cache. And we can basically say, hey, Redis, if you've seen this API call response, then serve the version that you have, and we'll not do all of that expensive compute again. And obviously, you don't want that to happen forever because yeah, the values in the API will change, and the document you've got is becomes old. So say you're caching weather information, you might want to keep it around for like an hour or 30 minutes or whatever the granularity of your weather forecast is, and then go get something else. So Redis is used a lot as a cache because it has this behavior where I can basically say expire Simon, and I can do say five. And then in five seconds, what's going to happen is you'll see this time to live here going down. And that key doesn't exist anymore. So Redis has forgotten about that. Um, and the ability to forget something after a certain amount of time sounds like a sort of crazy thing to want to do, but it's the basis of a cache, which is the, the common core use case for Redis. Um, so we'll show you that it can be used for a lot more things than that. So what I was going to do now was show you one of the Redis data types and then we can talk about how you access Redis from Python and then switch to a sort of more code-based demo. So let's go back to the slides here. So how you access Redis from a programming language is using what in Redis terminology is called a client. If you're familiar with other databases, um, it's really an SDK or a driver. Um, so it's a thing that maps Redis commands into meaningful functions in a target language. So a, a client for Python would take all of the Redis commands, so set, get, expire, the, there's hundreds of other ones, and expose those as Python functions that we can then call 
and have data sent to Redis, stored, retrieved, modified, etc. Um, this is great, and there's lots of clients out there that will do that. Uh, there's a very popular one called Redis Pi. Um, that is probably the one you should use if you want to do this stuff with Python. And we at Redis, the company, maintain that. And we also maintain a higher level client that is more like sort of object relational mapping tool. So there's no R in this because it's not a relational database. So it's an object mapping tool. So what does that mean? It basically means it goes the extra mile with making things a bit more Pythonic for some things. So here we can declare Python classes for things we want to store. We can easily save them into Redis. And then we can use some of the, the features of Redis, Redis search to go find things that match certain criteria, which would be very hard in a key value data store otherwise. Because if all we've got is the key, then all we can retrieve things by is the key without duplicating lots of data all over the place and having a complicated lookup system. It will be very hard to ask it questions like find everybody on this call who is between 30 and 45 years old, for example, because key value data stores aren't naturally set up for that. So we'll see how you can overcome that. And the um, Redis, hello. Can I interrupt you before? So no, you, said something, you said something interesting. Maybe you're going to talk about it later. If so, then stop me here. But mm. this is something that's interesting. You told us that we can store the Python object on Redis as an object, mm -hmm. as a Python object. It's similar to pickling it or something else? I'll let Savannah answer that because I'm not really the Python person. <laughs> um, so yes and no. Um, so, and this is something where, you know, I don't think anyone's really all, always an expert, um, but my use case for pickling has been to save data somewhere similar to how I would just like print everything out to a CSV and then read it in later. Um, yeah. This is a little different than that in the sense that what you're storing in Redis really is just the data that you're asking it to store. You don't have to, um, you don't have to like unpickle it or anything. You can sort of save the state of a Redis database and like spin it back up with all that information. It's like, that's a little bit more like what I would, that's a little bit more like pickling. Um, this is a little bit more like Redis has created or Redis Pi for, and for each of the client libraries, we've got um, like a node OM client and some other things, but for Redis Pi, the OM library sort of adds, like instead of, it's not quite as abstract as pickling. It's more like you're just saving the object into Redis and it, can be accessed the same way that you would access Python objects. Yeah, and then okay. for many other languages as well, because anything else that's got a, a client that can talk to Redis and knows that key, the thing's been serialized, if you like, into a common database-centric format rather than a programming language format. Um, and we have a couple of data structures that can do that for object-like things. So the one we're looking at on the screen here is called a hash. So if you imagine a hash being like a flat map of name value pairs, so a bit like a dictionary sort of, inside a single key in Redis. So the demo that we've got today uh, models uh, uh, animal adoption center. So they have animals that they want to put in their database. Each animal has an ID and that becomes part of the key because that's the thing that you know when you are accessing the animal. Imagine you like scan its tag and you sort of say, Oh, this is animal 1001. And then inside Redis, we have a bunch of name value pairs where we're storing data about the animal. So we can store, for example, here, a name, species, and an age. Uh, and we actually have the same schema over on the right as well, name, species, and age. But because Redis is a NoSQL database, there's no tables going on here, it doesn't actually care about what the schema is inside these things. So we could store different things for each animal. And as long as we don't want to search and retrieve by those things, that's OK. Um, yeah, so, so I guess uh, I guess in that sense, it is a little bit more like pickling, where if I use Redis Pi OM to save something to Redis, someone else can go access that same data using Redis GNOME for 
sorry, not GNOME, Redis Node OM. Um, so you can still access that data and you can still pull it out and access it from either client language. Um, but if you're just using Python, you don't have to like de pickle it or like sort of do any of that decoding yourself. Okay, so okay. what I was okay, so you basically you freeze the object and kind of put it in a way that most languages can extract it, something like that. Yeah, it'll it'll get translated to Redis data types, so we can kind of see that here. So if I start at the CLI okay. and I do h set, which is a command for setting things in a hash, uh, and I want to create something like uh, let's say users colon Simon, so. I'm going to store something about a user called Simon. Uh, two things here. This is a key name. It's a free choice of how you make up your keys. We kind of recommend using colons to separate sort of namespaced items. So if I know that I want to look up things about the user called Simon, I can figure out that the key is users colon Simon because I have a naming system going on here. And then inside here, I can give it some fields and values. So I could give it a name and put in my name. And I could give it something like, a, I don't know, let's say it's some sort of game. I can give myself some sort of experience points. And then I could give myself an email of my email. And when I do that, Redis says three, which is the number of things it's stored in the database. So if you're familiar with SQL, there's a couple of things here. Like number one, where did I tell it that user Simon was going to be a hash and like declare a schema for that? I didn't because you don't have to. Um, it just created that for me. And as you can see, it's appeared up here. And now we can see I've got the fields that we stored in here. So in this visualization tool, we have a single key user Simon that maps to all of this stuff. So what if I want to get some of that back? I can basically say hget users Simon and then the name of a field that I want to back, get back. So just the email, for example, get my email back, or I can do H get all users, Simon, and get everything that is stored there. And what Redis will return is actually a bunch of strings like this. And then what a client library will do is map that into say a Python dict, or in the case of the one we're going to show a, an object that has a, a schema associated with it. Or in the case of other languages, it'll depend on what, uh, makes most sense for the language. So some cases it's an array, some cases it will be a, an object. So if I take one of these, so I've created users Simon and kind of like not to label uh, label the point, but if we do hset users Savannah and we do name Savannah and then Simon's got an exp and an email. So for Savannah, we'll do like exp 59 and then we'll do something like location USA. So there's nothing wrong here. Redis doesn't care that these have got different schemas. It's just storing what we told it to. Um, so this kind of means that your application needs to be able to deal with that. Um, and that's sort of on the application code, but you've also now got a very flexible data store. So users Savannah has 59 EXP in a location in the UK and users Simon has doesn't have a location um, and that's okay. And inside this hash data structure, we can obviously change the values of certain things. So I can just overwrite something by setting them. Um, but another thing that Redis is really good at is um, numeric stuff. So imagine we're using EXP as a sort of score value. Without knowing what Savannah's score is, I can give her like another 10 EXP points. So I can do uh, H increment I, and then I have to say the field, uh, the key. So it uses Savannah and then the field EXP and then 10. And then I get 69 back. So I didn't waste a database trip saying, oh, how many EXP has Savannah got? Oh, I'll add 10 to that and then save it. It's um, I'm able to do that without asking it. Um, and Randy asks, is there a cost associated with Redis? Um, yeah, there is. Um, there's two sorts of cost is, no, well, okay, there's three sorts of cost. One is, this is a network uh, device or server, like most databases. So there's a network round trip latency cost of 
uh, how long it's going to take from your code to Redis and back again. Um, there's the cost of performing the Redis operation. Um, that's variable. And one thing we're really, really good about, if we go to um, Redis.io slash commands, is we can't tell you how long they're going to take uh, because that's very that, that depends on your hardware and a bunch of other things. But we can tell you, for example, that that H get all command that I used, it has a time complexity of big O of N. So what that means is the more stuff you put in a hash, the more stuff there is to get back out and serialized for transport across the network and the longer it's going to take. So the bigger the hash gets, the, the bigger this or the longer this command is going to take in relative terms versus something like if I go look at um, H set here, H set is big O of one for each field value pair added. So if I add two things, it'll be big O of two, take twice as long as adding one. Um, and Simon, I like that you were so generous and you're like, oh, this is a programming question. What's the time cost? And I'm wondering, do, are you asking about time cost or are you asking about how much does it cost to use Redis? Um, very different questions. Simon has True. answered the time cost dollar wise. Uh, <laughs> I believe Simon will show it a little bit later, but you can host Redis locally using Docker. Um, so you can do all of this. And actually, if you look at the link that should be in the meetup, you'll see that we've got a um, Git pod workshop for you guys to mess around with. And that's totally free to use. And you can add data to store on Redis locally using that Git pod. Um, when I'm doing live stream code, I actually run Redis locally through Docker. Um, so it's totally free for me when I'm doing all of these things. There is a free tier of using our cloud Redis. Um, the cost as far as how it's going to be calculated is how much data you're trying to store with us. Um, and to make it clear when I say with us, I don't mean Redis servers. Uh, we use big, we use big boy servers to host your data for you. Um, but you get Redis support and you get Redis functionality. So it's cost, it's calculated by how much data you're storing and what tier of, like what that range tier of data you need. Yeah, I mean, you can absolutely do this for free because this stuff's open source. So you can take on the hosting and the management of it yourself if you want to, um, or you can take it from us in the cloud, or you can run it through something that orchestrates Docker containers. Um, so it kind of depends where you like having costs. Do you want cost in your own time? Do you want cost in like maintaining people that answer the phone at 2 a.m. if something happens? Or do you want to like swipe a credit card and just not have any problems? Because um, your quick ad for our Redis instance is, you know, we can deal with scaling it for you and updating it and upgrading and all of that stuff. Um, the other cost that I will point out is associated with the speed. So everything in Redis lives in physical actual RAM. So this means to store like a gig in Redis, you need a gig of RAM that that process needs to uh, have available to it. Um, so here in this tool, we can see that I've, the things I've created are sort of like toy size. There are 121 bytes and 112 bytes. Um, my overall database size at the minute is one megabyte because that includes some overhead to do with managing the key space, uh, most of which is taken when you start a database and it's quite small and then you can put millions of keys in here and it won't grow very much. Um, how big can anything be? That means you're constrained by the amount of memory in your machine is the amount of data set that one instance of Redis can handle. But you can create a cluster and basically how you manage that is um, you map some keys to some members of the cluster and other keys to other members of the cluster. And then you can go above the physical size of RAM that's installed in a machine by adding lots and lots of machines together. Um, that's quite a complicated topic. And again, the short answer is you can do all of that in open source or you can just swipe a credit card and not have to worry about it. But Simon, I love that your first response was, oh, here's what the time complexity cost is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we do talk about that a lot. The other thing with time complexity is it looks like some commands are like really bad and dangerous and Redis is actually really fast. So yeah. it, we're still talking fast. It's just like 
what degree of faff versus other options. Um, so yeah, people put yeah, a lot. Oh, of... wait, wait, wait a second. Uh, if if you're talking about fast, you were saying complexity before, mm -hmm. and we won't go into the explanation of complexity. But basically, is Redis something like order one? Um, that totally depends on the operation you're doing. But what I mean is, compared to a disk-based store, our slow commands are going to be devastatingly fast because it's never going to have to go to disk to get anything. Um, and also the advantage of keeping your data in memory is it's very close to the transport format. So it doesn't need to be taken out of storage, transferred from whatever the storage format is into the format that you, the protocol uses to send it across the network. Okay. And back. Let, let, let me rephrase this. A dictionary in Python is order one complexity, mm -hmm. meaning it's, it's fast as any one operation. The, on average, it's not always like this the, because it's how it's designed. Basically, it's a hash. So, is right. Redis something very similar to a hash? I mean, over an entire Redis database, yeah, is essentially a hash table. But Good. the values so, in the hash table have different behaviors depending on their data type. So, if a value is a list, it will have different uh, functionality and different time complexities versus just getting a string back. But accessing an individual key will be a constant operation because it's just a hash table. Okay, so it's, uh, it's, so it's fast, but you also said one more thing that's important, that since you don't store on disk, and this is like a thousand times slower than accessing memory. We don't like... read from disk. There's an important differentiation there, because people think Redis is volatile and therefore can't be trusted. That's very much not true. All reads come from disk, so there's a copy of the data in memory at all times, all of it. So you write to disk, but you always access mem only memory so you're fast in in read we can also be fast in writes because well we are fast in writes because you can configure how you want persistence to happen so you can say when this thing happens persist immediately or you can say persist every so many of operation or every so many seconds um or persist when a certain number of or only return to the user when a certain number of cluster members have gone yeah i've got that change um so, so it's, very, it's very, very fast, and the faster it gets, the more volatile it is, but that's kind of the nature of these systems. So you can like dial that up and down according to your use case, yeah. Got it, thank you. Um, so Ran Randy asks, um, is it in, if it's all in memory, what's the advantage versus just using an internal Python dictionary? Uh, broadly, it's that you can share data that you put in Redis between different programming languages and multiple instances of imagine microservices or something. So imagine we had something that was picking a value off of a queue and Savannah's been doing some streams recently around that with Redis streams, which is a streaming data type. And imagine your know, jobs are getting put on that queue much faster than your one program can pull them off. You could fire up multiple instances of that. They'll talk to Redis and Redis can basically dish out the next job to them. Then they don't all need to be written in the same programming language. You can have some in Python, some in C, some in Node, some in Java. Uh, and the other advantage is Redis can do operations itself. So you don't need to implement things like a, a linked list. Redis will do that for you. Um, it's as simple as if I want to put some things in a list, I just do a list push, call it my list, and let's do A, B, C, D. And what you'll see is I didn't create a list. I didn't tell it anything about it. It's just managing that for me. So I've now got this list here um, and I can basically say to it, a uh, list pop my list and off comes D, C, B, A. I've now got a stack, but that stack's accessible across the network to multiple things. Um, and this list should now be empty because we've removed everything from it. And Redis went away and deleted that. Um, so generally, it's great for that. When you're using it as a cache, it's good for um, horizontal scaling as well. So you put multiple instances of like a web server on there, and they can share a cache, so they don't all have to do the same work and call the same backend APIs, get the same answer. They can pull it out of the cache. Yeah. So Jacob mentioned pickling. So if you were doing something where you want to maybe process a lot of data and then sort of have this saved state of data to do a lot of different things with. 
um, if you uploaded that to Redis, you can then have that all the time and you don't have to repickle it. You don't have to unpickle it. Um, you just have all that data at your fingertips from whatever script you decide to use as long as you are connected to that same Redis instance. Maybe you want to say something more about uh, pickling uh, for the beginners, absolute beginners that don't even understand what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, why why so, is pickle called pickle? Oh, I don't actually know. <laughs> well, they, don't you know? Like, if, if you take a cucumber and you put it uh, outside, it will spoil. Correct? Yeah. But what? If okay, you so it? it's I pickle it so it stays. It, it stays preserves the same. it. Okay. Okay. This is what um, it, this is what it does. It's, it's like puts it on. Uh, it's like putting things on ice. It's like. It preserves whatever you have in memory, just preserves it somewhere on disk or, or in string or whatever. Yeah. So. Um, so usually when I've used a pickle file, it's basically like I want to read in some data from a CSV, from whatever data source I've got, do some stuff to it, modify some data, do some analytics, whatever, what have you. And then I want to say, okay, this is the state of the data that I want to use next. Um, but I don't want to write this one huge Python file i want to split it up do good programming have you know meaningful file names all that so i can write it to a pickle file and then from a different script i can upload that pickle file well upload i can read in that pickle file unpickle it back into like a python dictionary and then start working from it whereas with redis i can just say okay redis here's the state of my data cool. okay so uh. Moving along. So, yeah, basically, we're going to look at some stuff with Redis hashes, which is kind of like a flat map of keys to values or an associative array. This maps well to Python dictionaries, also JavaScript objects, if you've worked with those. Um, and what we're going to do is we've actually got a hands on demo that Savannah's going to show us, and it works in something called GitPub, which is if you've not seen this before, is a really cool way of building an entire um, development environment in the cloud in seconds. And yeah, we'll we'll demonstrate some stuff with the Redis own client, which is a higher level way of, of talking to Redis from Python. So I'll stop sharing now. And um, Ismail is asking about. something about RAM before you stop sharing and all these. I want to, people to understand the difference between Redis and just having some, you know, dictionary on the computer. So I'll ask the following questions. What if I have one gigabyte of, um, of memory in my machine, an old machine with very little memory, and I'm running Python and I have a dictionary of, let's say, half a gigabyte. It will store, correct? I have no problem. I don't need Redis for it, correct? Uh, as long as, yeah, if you don't care about things like persisting it between sessions of running your Python program, or you don't want anything else to work with it, then yes. I can just work with the dictionary. Good. So I can pickle the data and then put it in. But this is not what Redis is for. Think about like all the transactions of, let's say, all credit card transactions in a bank. If you take the number, it will be one much, much, much bigger than one gigabyte. You cannot store it even in one machine, even in one big machine with a lot of memory, you can, it won't store. But it will store on Redis, correct? Yeah, basically, basically think of Redis as a database. So Savannah says in the chat, whenever you want to use the database, usually because you want to share data between different people or processes doing things, you want to offload some processing onto something else, you don't want to invent data structures or algorithms that are built into the data store. Um, and especially for things like microservices environments where you've got a lot of data coming in through a lot of different processes and you need to, for example, figure out if you've seen some of it before or when you saw some of it. Um, Redis is extremely good at that. So you can also think of, so you think of it as a cache, a database, a queue, a buffer, a stack, a lot of these like lower level um, data structures. And really it's, I sort of think of it as well as sort of shared memory as a service. So if you just wanted a very, very fast, like persistent 
variable or set of variables that have some nice behaviors with them and you wanted them to run in something that you can scale independently of your program then you should look at redis so on a little bit of a plug on thursdays on our live streams i am currently working in micropython with a device that is so small i've lost it on my desk it is um i'm working with a raspberry pi pico w it's like literally this big this How thing's much running, does it have? Uh, <laughs> don't know to be honest uh like maybe half a gig this thing is it's got wi-fi and it is really really good at being connected to sensors and stuff in the real world and it's really good at generating a lot of data it's terrible at running redis because it has no operating system so it can't do that it's a microcontroller um, but because redis has a really well-defined wire protocol you can from python form up essentially a bunch of python strings send them to a redis server and it will store you know data from here and then you can form up a bunch of strings and query that and then this thing can display, for example, what the average temperature was over the last day, month, week, year, with all of that data and processing being offloaded to a data store that can cope with it. Um, especially when there's like thousands and thousands of these in, in different, say, rooms in a hotel. So that's something I'm messing with. So we're kind of good at the very big data level. We're also good at being super efficient and working with the tiny, tiny devices. Hmm. So what's the limit of how much you can store? Um, it's pretty much RAM and the number of keys you can store is something ridiculous like two to the 32 minus one or something. It's some large C++ type number. Um, so not something that you're realistically going to hit. We have people <laughs> storing gigabytes and gigabytes of business data in, in Redis in the cloud. Um, and with, you know, the way, the, as I say, the way you scale it is clustering, because obviously, you know, one given machine can only have so much RAM in it. If you need to go beyond that, then you need multiple machines. And then you take your key space and you say, oh, all the user's keys live on that one. And all the uh, game state keys live on this other one and so on. So basically, it expands whatever Python has natively into things where you cannot no longer use Python. Data. Right. So we have so we have a question about I previously heard of Redis in the context of a Redis queue. Um, can we elaborate? And is this not a primary use case? No, it absolutely is a primary use case. Um, Redis, as I said at the start, is this interesting grab bag of things that one person happened to need for their personal project when they started building it. And um, I'm just going to uh, share again so if we were to build something like a queue there's quite often multiple ways you can do things in redis so what i'm going to do here is uh i'll push some things onto a queue so i've got a queue called jobs and i'm using a redis list for this which takes strings as its value so i could put json in here if i wanted to um but let's just say jobs include like clean room fresh towels and something else. I don't know, um, check out. So imagine we're a hotel and realistically I'd put JSON objects in here that had a room number and stuff. So we've now created a list of three jobs. And then what I can do with my uh, terminal here is start another connection to this same Redis. So imagine like I'm the front desk here and I'm pushing jobs that need doing onto a queue. I can start a thing over here, and then we have a command called uh, brpop, which is a blocking command, and we'll talk about what that means in a minute. I can say jobs uh, and 5,000. Basically, what that's going to say is, if there's anything on the jobs queue, give me the next one. If there isn't, kick around for 5,000 milliseconds, so five seconds, and see what happens. So the job that came off the queue is clean room. Uh, what we'll see when this thing updates when I turn the auto refresh on is that that has gone off of the queue now. If I do it again, the next job was get fresh towels. And let's just go back here and add one. 
So let's put something else on there. You'll see that appears. And when I go here, the next job is checkout, and then it's going to be something else. And now what happens, uh, the queue doesn't exist anymore because there wasn't anything in it. So Redis deleted it. Um, Redis is quite intelligent. So if you ask it to wait on a queue that doesn't exist, it's going to wait. And if nothing happens in the five seconds, it's going to come back and say nothing in the queue. So let's let that happen. Um, Actually, that's much long. That's seconds. Sorry, not milliseconds. That's going to be a very long time. Let's do this properly. Oops. So, if nothing happens in five seconds, then hopefully it comes back with nil and says there is. There we go. There's nothing there. Um, so, if we set this off again, and as soon as I go and add, might not be able to type fast enough. No, I can't. Set it off again. As soon as I add X to there, X got pulled off the queue and this came back in under the five seconds and now the queue is empty. So that's one way we can build a queue. Um, another way we can build a queue is using something called a Redis stream that's a more complicated data type and that will give us an append only log and it will timestamp everything for us. So that's quite a complicated topic that I would recommend go looking at Savannah's streams on YouTube to learn about. Mm -hmm. Can you put okay. this a link? Yeah, I'll put that put in this the a chat. link to those links. Yeah. Let the, me, uh, those streams, sorry. Stop that and I will hand over to Savannah. Yeah, I'm uh, responding a little bit in chat. So you need 20 seconds to finish out this message. Mm -hmm. Uh, the TLDR is that if you're questioning like whether or not you need to use Redis, um, you know, you can absolutely just check out the Docker. Um, you can just install that Docker file and you can run Redis locally and you can start using those commands locally and just like an r.set, r.get. And you can really just see like how that impacts your application development, how that impacts what you're able to do. Um, you know, a, a big data store definitely isn't necessary for everything. Um, this is sort of, you know, it, it is a database. So if you're trying to access the same data in different places, if you're trying to have multiple people being able to access and edit data and pull this data, and you need to make sure it's all the same data, um, you know, those are all like good reasons that you might want to start looking at like a hosted database. And on that note, I will share screen. And for argument's sake, I'm going to sort of like start over at the top here. Um, we have our Redis OM Python search demo. Uh, we've got a couple of different ways that you can use this, but I'm going to show you guys how to run this demo entirely in the cloud with Gitpod. The only things you need there are a modern browser, we've tested it with Google Chrome, and a GitHub account. Since I have both of those things, I'm just going to click Open in Gitpod. And it's going to start working on all this stuff. And what this Gitpod environment does is it basically makes it so that, like, I don't have to install anything. I don't have to worry about, oh, um, that little small message, I, click, I clicked copy. Uh, it basically is like a permissions thing between your local VS code and GitHub. I trust the authors of this. So now I've got, um, without having to clone the repo, without having to worry about any dependencies, without having to worry about any library installs, um, I can just type Python loadadoptables.py and it starts working. Um, this code I'll Go back to GitHub real quick um, to show you guys a little bit more about what that code is. Just because I, I like the white background for the contrast um, when presenting. When I'm actually writing code, I'm a big fan of dark theme. Um, but as far as presenting goes, I think the uh, white background is nice. So for loadadoptables.py, we've just got this animal data.csv. 
uh, we're using some pretty standard Python libraries, i.e. CSV, um, and reading that file in. And then the main things here are this, we've created this adoptable uh, right here that we've imported. So we'll take a look at that next. But basically we're just saving an adoptable animal, an adoptable animal. And then we're using this migrator.run, um, which basically this migrator.run is, it's basically the pickle function here. Um, it's the take the data that I've given you and create Redis search indexes, put it into all of these things that the OM library really like exceeds at or excels at. Um, so this adoptable.save, like that data is saved in Redis with that adoptable.save. But to be able to use sort of the enhanced functions of searching, you need to use this migrator.run. Um, and then that adoptable dot pi. This is where it really looks, you know, essentially like a Python class. We've got a class called adoptable. Uh, we've created it as a hash model. We also have a JSON model, which is pretty powerful as well. Um, There are a couple of differences, but for the most part, you'll find that they do most of the things similarly. Um, but so this class just has a bunch of different, um, what's what I'm looking for? Fields, I guess. Uh, so you can clarify what types you want them to be. You can say whether or not you want them to be indexed. So for instance, if you have some superfluous data that you don't want to be able to search on, uh, you don't have to include that index. You don't have to, you know, include that because that does take up a little bit of that overhead that Simon was mentioning about why, you know, with 220 byte things, it still looks like a megabyte. And that's just because to be able to search for those things, we have to store a little bit more information about those things. So you can also do a full text search, which means that um, you can sort of look for things like contains, like does this whole paragraph contain the word house trained, or that phrase, does it contain house trained? Um, so. Here is another look. difference from pure Python dictionary. Because you're showing yeah. now the ability to actually look and search. A dictionary you can access only by the key. You're telling us when you actually store information on Redis, you can actually uh, have kind of multiple keys. The index is a key, correct? Uh, or am I missing something? Essentially, yeah. Um, I, so, yeah, so we'll get into if you look at um, query adoptables.py. Um, yeah, these are going to run, and um, we're going to look at a little bit of how to change which one of these things runs. Right now, if you run this script, if you have hopped on the Git pod repo and you're in VS Code, or whatever code editor of your choice. Um, if you run this query adoptables file, you'll get all of the adoptable animals named Luna. Um, but you can find, so like this is the description field. So right here we're showing, we want to return adoptables and then this dot find is how we sort of start our Redis search with all of our keywords, all of our indexes, uh, so this first operator is a not, it negates it. So this is saying, I want to look at cats, good with children. And my criteria for that is that the adoptable dot description does not contain the word anxious. Uh, and anxious will apply to a couple of other things. It will do anxious, it will do anxiously. Uh, same with nervous, it will do nervous, nervously, nervousness. Um, so it will look for that as like any part of a word. It doesn't just look for that as the start and end. It will say, does it contain that sequence of letters anywhere? Um, yeah, so if you're in this demo with us, like down here is where you can change what those search queries, uh, which one you wanna show the results for. And then you can start sort of messing around. Um, this is like dogs in age range, so we've got 
multiple queries. Um, I guess we had them here too, but I didn't really talk about it there. So this and, you basically just separate any clauses that you want with an and sign. Uh, so instead of saying like an adoptable.age is less than eight, or sorry, greater than eight, less than 11, you have to break that up into two where the adoptable age is greater than eight and the adoptable age is less than 11. Um, but yeah, I think that's a good uh, high level overview of that repo. Um, so like I was saying, how if you're opening it in Gitpod and you give it the appropriate permissions, all I did here was run that's from other things. Uh, right here, all I did was run python load adoptables.py. And then if I go to, oh, I stopped typing. If I look at, do I have insight pulled up? I don't. I believe it's 8001. Um, you can see here all of my keys from all of my streams. Um, I should somewhere in here, oh, this is a mess. I should clean this out first. <laughs> um, but as far as persistence goes, you can see very clearly that uh, these are you know, keys that I was streaming with earlier today. And here they are in Redis searchable. Um, All that to say, I'm not going to dig through that on stream with uh, live with you guys. But if you have Redis Insight installed, which right here, it will contain an embedded browser window with the Redis Insight database visual tool. Um, you'll be able to see all of those keys and you will probably have significantly fewer, uh, significantly less errant data living in your Redis Insight than I currently do. Yeah, so if you do want to play with this demo, you don't even need VS Code installed. So what we're looking at on the screenshot there yeah. is Gitpod will also just run all of this stuff for you in the cloud. So they'll run VS Code, pre-install our Insight to we'll get you a Redis instance and install all the Python dependencies. So by the time you hit that terminal, it just works. Um, so this is like sort of adjacent to this being a Redis demo. Gitpod, if you haven't seen it before, they're really... <laughs> So compelling way of building environments where you want to share something potentially complicated with someone, but they don't have to install anything or even have a machine that's capable of running it. It's all computes done in the cloud. Yeah. Um, so because I have VS Code installed and I have given Gitpod all those permissions before, that's how it opens for me. Um, but you can do it all in the cloud. Uh, you can also do a local setup. You can actually clone this repository, uh, do the pip install dash R for the requirements, all of that good stuff. Um, I think it gives a pretty solid rundown of what the queries do. Um, one thing I would say is if you're looking for some of that search stuff, we are already sort of working on documenting those different operators. Uh, so you'll notice that to query the adoptable animals to look for that like contains is this modulo operator um, some of those aren't super easy to find uh, but we are working on that as we speak um, so yeah please let me know if you guys have any questions about redis om for python in particular um, like we said earlier, it does have other client libraries associated with it. So like there's a Redis OM for Node for a couple of other libraries that we see frequently used. Uh, but we're at a Python meetup and I'm a Python person. So that's the only one I can really answer any, any questions about with, uh, with any good chances of knowing the answer. Yeah, I think the, the main sort of takeaway between the two segments of this talk, if you like, our oh, Redis is a key value store, so it's not table based. And that means that you kind of need to know the key to retrieve things, except it's also got this search functionality. <laughs> so if you can define what you want it to search, you can then use it in a model that looks a bit more like SQL. Um, mm -hmm. 
this is also blazingly fast because Redis keeps everything in memory. So it keeps copy of the index in memory. And every time you change one of the data structures that it's indexing, it updates that for you automatically. So there's little to no indexing lag involved here. So if you put in a fire hose of data, it will keep up with indexing it pretty well. I mean, obviously, you have to scale the hardware you're running on to cope with that, but there is no... Please, please explain indexing to the people in our meetup. We have quite a bit of beginners. They, they don't understand what the idea of indexes is, like in a database. So sure, please, sorry. in simple words, no, don't go far. I can try and demonstrate this with a... Yeah, you want the screen back, Simon? With... Yeah, go on, then. let's try this. Okay, so hopefully that's sharing. So yeah. if you see, so I have two two things here, right? So if you imagine a, a SQL database, we might have a table called users and we might have a primary key in that table and that's the user ID. So that'd be like Savannah and Simon. And I could do something like select star from users where user uh, where ID is Simon and EXP is greater than 40. And SQL's going to do that. And generally what indexing means is that we store a sort of pre-computed location for where some of these things are or what their values might be. So in a SQL database, we'll always index the primary key. We can actually add other indexes. So I can say I want it on like the EXP value and it will kind of keep tabs on those. Um, Redis isn't going to do that out of the box because it's key value store. So given these two bits of data, users Simon, users Savannah, how do I ask a normal Redis instance without a search functionality what, what users have more than 40 EXP points? And traditionally, the way you do that in a key value store is by replicating some of the data into other data structures. So, for example, with Redis, if we wanted to look at how many people or who's got what um, experience values, we would use something like a sorted set. So I could do Z add, which is the command for add something to a sorted set, and I could call it users by exp because that's what I'm storing there. And then I could do 40 and Simon and how many Savannah's got now? 69. Um, 69. Savannah. And what has that done? It's created another data structure in here. So you start like denormalizing the data, which is okay for key value stores. They're kind of optimized for that. Um, but the thing with this is to then say who's got 40 or more, I would do something like uh, Z range users by EXP. Um, I say 40 and then the biggest number possible. Oh, okay. No, I don't know how I'm to, what I'm doing here. So <laughs> I will get there. Oh, there's a command for this that I should look up. But basically, I can ask this a question that says, get me the people with those scores. Um, and it will do that. So if I, um, if I were to do that, I could then get like, Simon has 40 and Savannah has 69. And then to get any more information about Simon and Savannah, I have to know that that's stored in a key that has users colon in front of it, make that key name up and go get the information out of here. So like what's Simon's name? If this became something that we did a lot, we might then want to create another data structure that maps say um, EXP points to user name or something. And then we've denormalized the data small. So what the search thing in Redis does is it allows us to say, hey, track some of the fields in here um, while still keeping that flexibility. If we can just add random other fields in here that aren't tracked or don't apply to all the records without changing a database schema because there isn't one. Uh, and it'll do that with a process that runs in the database and updates the thing in memory so that I can write queries that I might not have envisaged needing to access the data in that way when we design the application. One of the downsides of a strict key value store is you kind of need to think about all your access mechanisms when you're designing something. So if I know I need to access people by EXP range, just putting it inside their user profile is, is not going to work. 
Um, but with the search functionality, I can blow away this extra data structure. I don't need it because what I do would be, I would say, hey, EXP is a field I'm interested in searching. It's a number. And then the search engine would watch over that for me and it will be allow me to write queries that say hey get me everybody who's got an exp 42.99 and i yeah. don't need to worry about anything else about how the data is stored it's so for you know talking in terms of like relating this into python if you have a python dictionary um it sort of is like one of those keys it doesn't create a new key as far as redis is concerned you can't access just that key it still has to be accessed through that higher level, like um, users.savannah.experience. Um, but it's almost like imagine if you had a Python dictionary where you had a couple of keys and then you had like an extra data field. That extra data field is all of the other stuff that you're not indexing. And then by creating a key and saying a key in that dictionary, not in Redis, um, it's sort of saying like, hey, I want to be able to search for this field in particular. And I want to be able to access this field in particular. The rest can be extraneous where to access that I have to pull in the whole object. So like a dictionary where if to access that extra field, I had to load the entire dictionary and then look at that field. I can do that. I can find that data, but it's not something I can like ask for. Great. So what I've done really quickly here is just fired up this demo inside the browser entirely so there's nothing running locally here um, and loaded all the data so what you can see for our animals is we have chosen key names of demo colon adoptable colon and then some largely meaningless id so if we know the id we can access the animal really easily so if we scan the tag and the tag has this on it then we can open that up and say okay this okay, animal, this animal appears to be a uh, what have we got here a dog called bruno he weighs 21 whatever we're weighing them in and so on um this is okay if we're having a use case where like we know we're going to scan the tags and that's the only way we're going into the the data if we then wanted to use this data as the basis of like a website for the public to choose the public don't choose dogs based on their tag number they choose dogs based on like age weight breed are they good with children so all of this other stuff and in a traditional key value store you would have to then start putting this into other data structures and potentially making it parts of keys or using things like the sorted set so you can do ranges and if you use redis search and the the redis own client for python you get this higher level query interface it just says just find me everything that is a dog and is between this this age range and also you, we have this free text field here. You can then do fuzzy matching searches on there. So you get something like Elasticsearch type capability over this. Uh, so this basically gives you all the, all the benefits of a key value store, no, no schema, all the benefits of Redis very fast and recovers some of what you've lost from not living in the SQL world by adding a, a query engine on top of it. Okay. And then in, in terms of how's this different from Python, you just basically model your thing as clash as hashes and or as a class and annotate them with, hey Redis, I'm interested in these sorts of things. And you know, it knows, for example, that this should be indexed as a number. Everything else it's going to index as text, because they're text type data types. And then this one we're saying index it as text but also do like stemming matches on it, which as Savannah said, costs some memory, but gives you all of this extra functionality. Do, do, do you have any capabilities uh, that, like uh, data classes of Pydantic that will generate an error if whatever you're trying to plug in is incorrect or? Yeah, so this, this here is actually a Pydantic model. So you can turn validation on on this. And these are these can be Pydantic data types. So you could, for example, use the email address and um, it'll then be rejected at a Python level if you try and build an object that has an email address in before it even hits the database. OK. Um, I think it's time to open the 
the floor for questions. You've been getting them, but like maybe, maybe people are shy. So maybe Let's someone see, quite oh. interested in question, asking questions other than me. Um, hi. Okay. Sure. First of all, thank you so much, Simon and Jacob, to uh, keeping your videos on. <laughs> You know, uh, it's been like, you know, just a week that I started like, you know, uh, working on a Python because I'm a cybersecurity student in uh, Virginia's university. So uh, could you please say something that how is like, you know, going to be the difficulty level if I'm 100% focused and I'm ready to learn, ready to adapt everything and like, you know, watching a lot of uh, YouTube videos and trying my best best to run the codes by myself and everything so just want to know something related to that well you, you basically let's focus the question you, you're asking a question generally on python but let's focus it on regulus how easy or how hard it is to actually learn redis or redis on python uh is that question to me no 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 it's for for our experts it's like oh okay okay go ahead go ahead it's like I'm 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 trying to rephrase it so it will fit on on Redis. Um, I would say if you come in from a position of not having used other databases, it's probably easier because you don't have to unlearn some things. So if you use a SQL database, you have to create these create table things and think about how you're storing your data. And Redis, you just basically run a command for like. S add, so set add, the name of a key and what you want to put in there, and then you've got a set. And there's nothing for like, oh, I would need to declare a set or think about how big it's going to be or all of those things. Um, so I would say it's fairly straightforward if you're not already thinking in SQL. If you're thinking in a relational database world, then you kind of have to undo some of that and let go of maybe some sort of sacred concepts that don't apply to the NoSQL world. In terms of, is it easy to work with with Python? Um, yeah, basically the, the model is we have commands that do different things with the database. They're all documented. And then how you use those from Python is just, it's just a function name that's named after the command that takes the parameters that the, the documentation shows you. Um, we sort of shameless plug. I did put some a URL in the in the chat for Redis University, so we have uh, courses online that will teach you all of this stuff from basically assuming no knowledge of of key value databases. And at uh -huh. least three of those use Python. So. Nice. Any more questions from the audience? Mm -hmm. No more questions? I mean, hey, no questions means that no one got stuck on the demo or no one tried it, but I'm going to go with no one got stuck. Yeah. Just a quick <laughs> question. Uh, just wonder, um, from my understanding, it looks you, you've mentioned that um, most of the, the value can be stored and retrieved via the key. Is that what you say what it is? And mm -hmm. anyone who has access to the key can access the stored values. Uh, anyone who has access to the key as well as access to the actual database. Um, so Simon and I both were using something totally local. Um, so like you can't just sort of access that Redis instance because like, it, it only exists on my machine right now. Yeah. Um, you can set up a Redis server in the cloud where like it is password protected. You can have users, uh, all that stuff. So as far as like just being able to access that data, it's you know, if you know what to ask for and you have access to that database, um, you know. Okay. Yeah, the, the security model is based on access control lists. So you, uh, if you've seen Redis until about two years ago, it was either no password or one password gives you access to everything. Um, since Redis 6, which is now a couple of years old, it's access control levels so you can create named users and you can lock them down so they can only operate on certain parts of the key space and only operate on certain commands either like a named set that you choose or ones that we've predetermined are like dangerous or right or you know things that 
it, we have sets that allow you to easily create, say, read-only users on a subset of the database if you want, but it's totally flexible. All right, thank you. Interesting. So it's one more thing you cannot do with the dictionary. It's like you cannot have a security on the dictionary, you can have on Redis. Uh, yep, and you can't share it between multiple instances unless you put like an HTTP server on the front of it or something, oh, which yeah. is essentially what we're doing for you. Okay. Krish, you Simon. probably want to ask a question. Go ahead. Y yes, <laughs> thanks. Um, so if you are already using Redis on a smaller level, um, let's say less than less than a gig, um, how easier or convenient would it be to migrate that to AWS memcached? Um, I mean, I would it make sense to take it to uh, Amazon Cloud? considering, uh, let's say, uh, you have your organization needs uh, where everything is already being proprietary with, uh, with Amazon. So in that kind of uh, situation, what kind of challenges can we expect? Um, I mean, this sort of comes down to, I guess, latency right so you want your data as close as possible to the code that's accessing it because it keeps the the latency down um so we can't really comment about amazon's own products so elastic cash or redis is an open source project other people fork it and host it themselves um what we offer at redis.com is our cloud is kind of your cloud so if you build a cloud database with us you can choose which like real cloud provider you want to use. So we don't have our own pretend cloud, it's Azure or AWS or Google. And you can choose what region to, to put it in for proximity. Uh, in terms of moving stuff, you'd normally sort of back up the database and then replay a, a log into a new version of it with more memory. Um, or we have migration tools if you can't do that. You know, if you can't take something down, there's something on uh, Redis developer, which is developer.redis.com. There's a tool called Riot, and that allows you to migrate a running database in a, a whole bunch of different ways from one place to another. Um, you also mentioned memcache. If you were going from Redis to memcache, you would lose nearly all the data types. So you'd have to be storing basically only strings. Uh, if you went from memcache to redis you would conversely get quite a lot of extra functionality it depends if you're only using it as a cache and you're only using it for strings then that's not a concern yeah that's why uh, i mentioned if you are already using red redis but on a much smaller uh, scale uh for let's say my application has like very basic needs and uh, but the requirement is from an organization organization perspective um using something on an open source might not be uh you know getting approvals would be difficult let's say and that uh, stringent requirement to use something in aws uh, in, in in that kind of situation yes i understand redis has a lot more features um a lot of um, much bigger support for different data types um but if my my requirement itself is much scale down in that case. Okay, yeah, somebody was asking okay, about yes. uh, Flask, so Flask. I know Savannah's got recent experience with that as well. Yeah, yeah, um, let's, let's hope, uh, let's, let's, hope uh, let's keep the questions that are not ready to later for later, well, at some point we'll move towards the mingling, uh, but I want to see if anyone has more questions about Redis. Or Redis and Python, but but Redis related. So Simon, one of the questions in the chat was um, the simplest implementation of Redis, and asking if that's Docker. And I said, as far as ease of use goes, I love the Docker images. Um, I find that really simple to use and spin up. You do have to have Docker Desktop, so I don't know if it is like the technically simplest. Any thoughts, Simon? 
probably is that covers most things. Or if you don't have hardware that is capable of running Docker, then yeah, we'll go use our free trial. It's 30 meg and it's feature complete. Um, but if you want something really simple that's also like located very, very close to your code wherever you happen to run it, then Docker makes a lot of sense. Uh, actually, so that, those not familiar with Docker, essentially Docker is a, a way of storing an entire machine image and running it somewhere, um, anywhere, so in the cloud or locally. And we provide those for Redis and Redis with some extra functionality. So you don't have to worry about an operating system or compiling the product or installing it. Actually, talking about this, Docker doesn't always, or at least the earlier versions, of it had problems of like incompatibility on some Windows machines. Um, how does Redis and different operating systems work, or does it work only on one? And that's why you offer it as, in a, as a Docker, or uh, no? You can spin Redis up on. I, I mean, I'm going to say most common-ish distributions. Um, PC Windows is a little bit you know, tough as Windows tends to be for development. Um, I know we've done a few pieces of content on spinning Redis up on Windows, though. It's totally possible. Uh, and then we've got different pages for getting started with Redis on, I'll say, most of the common distributions, um, most of the common, like, common like Linux distributions, um, Mac, OS, Unix, Unix. A lot of a lot of those distributions are all, all like, some of them have slightly different setups. Um, but we've got a page dedicated to most of that. So pretty pretty OS friendly. Yeah, the the sort of less friendly one is Windows because Redis depends on a memory model that Windows doesn't have. Um, so that's not a like company or open source project choice that we don't like Windows. It's just it's built in a way that's more Linux friendly. So what we tell people is use WSL, the Windows subsystem for Linux, if you want to run it locally on there, and then it, it runs absolutely fine. Um, OK. It's important to know. Um, uh, any more Redis related questions from the crowd? Well. They're still with us, so this means like they, they haven't gone away. So it's like well, they're interested, but the question is, are they shy or are all the questions not Redis related? Yeah, just a quick hey. question. If I wanted to get you know more in depth understanding of uh, you know the commands and all that, do you guys have any documentation online, any website maybe I can be pointed to? Yeah, um, as far as like just like looking at the commands um our redis.io slash commands um you can sort of see simon pulled it up earlier during the talk um and you can filter by like what type of thing you want to use and it'll show you all of the available commands for that so i think simon you pulled up like the sorted set commands i think it might have been something else um but you can filter it based on what data type you're using and it'll show you all of the available commands and for a note there the syntax and the like optional versus required arguments for that will be for the Redis CLI, which um, is what Simon was doing sort of in that Insight browser where he wasn't really coding in Python. It was just, you know, it looked like a command line. Um, those commands that you see on that Redis.io slash commands page, that syntax will be for that Redis CLI. Um, if you want to get into like the Python version of those, uh, that's actually something we're working on right now is having like tabs on that commands page to show the different syntax for all of those. Um, but for now, if you go look at the Redis Pi source code, it's, it's I think, incredibly readable Python code. Um, and you can just sort of search for like the command that you find on Redis.io and it will tell you all about the arguments and what it's expecting and what that output is for like Redis Pi specifically. Thanks. Yeah, it's very useful. Thank you. Okay. Um, it is, we are starting getting questions from not only Redis. So um, at this point, unless there's one more pressing question, or maybe one more, more, maybe two more pressing questions, 
If you don't have any more pressing questions on Redis, then maybe we can stop the recording and move to other topics. Uh, what do you say? That's yeah, good. and I'm planning on sticking around. I know it's pretty late for Simon, um, but I am at heart a Python developer, so I'm planning on sticking around. So if something pops up later in chat, I can attempt to give it an answer. Perfect. Yeah, so... I'm going to drop because it's 2.35 a.m. <laughs> for me. But thanks, everybody, for coming to learn about Redis. Um, as I say, if you're interested in, in follow-ups and chatting with like us specifically or on the members of our team, the Discord link is definitely the place to go. We're, we're in there all okay. the time. Be be before you go, let us all thank you uh, properly. So everyone who wants to make noise, unmute yourself and make some noise and uh, or put something in the chat or whatever, clap whatever. So thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you all for your time. Thanks for having us. Okay. Thank you. And I